I usually just accept whatever people say around me so I don't look like the angry black woman. I mean, I'm okay. Uh, I don't. Mm. My name is Unique. Unique. Unique Quay. No, 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 no. Unique Quay. Unique. I mean, I can clearly see it. Thank you for spelling it out for me. I wouldn't want to say it wrong. Unique Quay. No, it's no, 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 no. It's my name. Listen to me. I gotta go. But I catch lunch sometimes. Okay. okay. I'm also part Chinese. It's so complicated. Why don't you choose one side? Uh, I already have chosen because, you know, I, I eat with chopsticks. Yeah, but I know how to use pork and like also. And I love soul food. Clearly, black people love soul food. So. Soul food, but not soul music. You know, I prefer classical Chinese. That's only like shower music. I don't, I'll rock out to Yo Yo Ma in the shower, but like, if my friends, I'll listen to all that Beyonce, Nicki Minaj, stuff. So well, you know what? At least people don't come up to me and ask if I'm related to Steve Urkel. Yeah, well, at least I don't walk into uh, a, a Chinese buffet and then I immediately see like 20 of my family members. How do you feel about that? Okay, okay, okay. So, what are you? 
Oh, but you know, I'm, I'm definitely. I'm black. I'm black. I'm black. There was, I was kidding about all that Asian okay. stuff. I'm like totally black, 70% cocoa, midnight chocolate, <laughs> and a chocolate black, you know, all that good stuff. God. But really just black? I never thought about my race until I got rid up for it. Are you listening to me? Are you truly comprehending what I'm saying? See, I am not defined by the color of my skin, but America doesn't seem to think so. Come on. What? No, no, that is not what I'm time. saying. Right? It's all about the statistics. Can you really listen to what I'm saying? It's about the numbers. No, okay. no. Stop Everything you do does not matter. It. it just doesn't matter. Listen to me. This is not what I'm saying at all. Would you wear my jacket with me? Would you wear, Would you my, wear jacket my jacket with, with me? Would you wear my jacket with me? Would you? Would you wear my jacket with me? Thank you. Would you wear my jacket with me? Would you wear my jacket with me? My name is Gregory Wolf. I was the director and sort of the manager of this project. However, what you just saw, I did not write. That was written by a group of 12 people. And these 12 people were of many different races, but we found there were some things we all agreed on and we all wanted to say. And those were three main things. That everyone suffers from the effects of racial stereotyping, because it destroys your individual identity and it fractures any sort of common humanity between people of different races. Second, that we think we can overpower stereotypes with compassion, with finding that common humanity. And third, that when we overpower stereotypes, the fact that we are different is not a barrier to collaborating. So part of this is, I'm gonna try not to just make a speech about collaboration, but to collaboratively make a speech so a number of us are going to talk. Likely, most people are not aware of how much their thoughts can seriously impact the world. All it takes to create a stereotype is just one false rumor, and like any piece of trivia, it's stored away in our heads like that. <coughs> when that one rumor becomes millions of people believing the same lie, that's when the victims of stereotypes become trapped and seriously hurt. Unfortunately, it is hard to forget a thought once you've ga gained it, but it could be easy to change a thought. If we can absorb stereotypes into our mental hard drive, then we should be able to absorb the truth just as easily. The best time to do this would be from the start, because like any d disease, years of suffering and hate would never happen if the necessary steps were taken to prevent it. To avoid stereotyping, there's only one step, to have a healthy skepticism. Because when you look for the truth, what once would have been a vicious lie is instead a step 
towards learning something more about an individual. And when millions of people possess the truth, that's when we can grow in wisdom and in society. That's when we can start to truly acknowledge one another. When you look at the person sitting right next to you, tell me, what do you see? Go ahead, take a look. Do you see maybe the tattoos and piercings that they may have? Or maybe you notice the clothing that they had first, or the color of their skin. What if we choose to see something that is skin deep? What if we choose to see the beauty of their connection to the human race? You see, I realize that in my choosing to love and embrace the, difference, the myriad of differences in this society, I in turn have learned to better understand people for who and what they are past the external and certainly past the hearsay. Now, we may never certainly understand every single viewpoint of each individual. However, we should not ignore their common humanity. So when I say the word contact, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The first thing that comes to my mind is more than just physical form of contact or the verbal. It's the emotional contact that involves us investing ourselves into the world and those who surround us. If you think about it, we only encounter the world through what we see, hear, taste, smell, or touch. But our understanding of that world comes from our emotions. Emotion is inherent within us. It's part of what makes us human. And in fact, it's kind of like our sixth sense. It is sort of the root of our humanity and the essence of our compassion. And the thing is, if you do it right, you can use this emotion as a framework to build positive and meaningful connections and conversation with others and with yourself. What is compassion? Now, we cannot simply speak about compassion without mentioning the force of love because compassion is the purest form of love the kind that shatters stereotypes. Growing up in the church, one of the several scriptures that was embedded in my heart was 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I repeat, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, I'm not here to preach, <laughs> but rather clearly explain how love conquers all. But first, what is love? I'm not referring to a romantic love or, or even a brotherly love, but instead a gothic love. It is an everlasting love, a non-consequential love, a self-sacrificing love, agape. It is a universal love. So in order to not only shatter stereotypes, but to also create a beloved community, we must practice love in deed and in truth. According to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the beloved community is a global vision in which all people are interconnected, despite someone's background, race, gender, class, etc. So ultimately, do not fail to practice love and action by falling to myths or preconceived notions about each other. So now, from compassion, we move to collaboration. And there's something I want to talk about in terms of collaboration of actually how we collaborated to create this, how we wrote this together, how we figured out what we would do together, was with a process called devising, which is a way of making theater. So normally, in traditional sort of Western theater, we have these roles. There are the actors and the writers and the dancers and the designers, and we kind of like self-segregate into our little roles. And success in this model is defined as when you fulfill like the checklist of expectations for your role. In devising, it's like everyone in the theater company is a writer. Everyone is an actor. Everyone is a designer and a dancer. And we all shift roles fluidly. And it's crazy, but it works. Um, what happens in this model is that success is no longer fulfilling like a checklist of expectations based on what you are defined as, but it's creatively serving the needs of the group at any given moment. So my thinking is, how can we apply this analogy to race? Because racial stereotypes have this sort of like checklist of expectations that 
an example might be something like if you're white, it would be go to college. If you're African American, go to the NBA. If you're Asian, do math, and these, you know, the list can go on. And it's the basically not like devising. So the question is, what if it were? Now, how can we learn to be open to trying on each other's jackets? How can we learn to approach conversations first with the goal of being compassionate before being right? And how can we turn our conversations about race into collaborations about race? So we don't have all the answers, but one idea is we can start devising. Thank you.